everyone, and welcome to the Two Real Cinema Club. My name is Andres Lorente. And I am James Rosica. And uh, every episode on the Two Real Cinema Club, we watch two movies. We watch a new movie and an old movie, and then we try and connect the dots. Uh, generally, the dots have been formed by donkeys in all of our recent episodes. Happily, this is our first donkey-free episode um, for quite a few weeks, although we have got a film that features horses, so we're only one step away. Oh, boy, and bears, too, coming up. Bears. I don't want to spoil it. We're changing our animals, but no more donkeys. <laughs> Certified donkey-free. We're moving up the food chain. Um, speaking of moving up the food chain, we have a celebration this week because guess who made it onto the IMDb this week? Ooh, I did. I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the club. I'm joining you in the IMDb <laughs> club. Truth, truth be told, I've probably been there a year or so, but someone finally told me, and then it took a few hours of digging. But I did find myself among all the other Laurentes. There are a lot of Laurentes in IMDb, which makes me proud. But uh, I have a single credit. And it's the best credit to have. I can die happy now. I am credited on IMDb as a stunt driver. Oh, yes. It's badass. <laughs> badass. Yes. All those years of training have finally paid off. <laughs> Which is, it's laughable because I am the safest driver, the wimpiest driver you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> but I did do a little bit of driving on a short film called Duel that my friends, uh, uh, Sam Brosnan and Jason Carrero did, uh, boy, about three or four years ago. I think they finished it at the height of COVID. So it's probably been out there two or three years. They got some pretty good buzz on some festivals and such. Um, and if you dig deep and you have to spell it D-U-A-L, dual, it's a clever little horror film of sorts. Spooky psychological drama sort of thing. And um, you wouldn't see me because I do sort of disappear into the frame as a stunt driver. They don't show my face wisely. Um, what you mean is you're driving so fast and it's not possible for the camera to capture your features. No, we just, we'd shot it in regular time and then sped it up. <laughs> I kid. No, we didn't do it. I, actually, it, it was uncomfortable. I don't know if you've ever done this where if you've ever worked on a super amateur film and you're actually two cars just driving fast next to each other so you can get footage of the other car. Um, oh, right. You're, so you're taking up the whole road and you're just praying that no one comes on. Um, it was quite scary. And then you're driving faster than I wanted to be driving. And uh, so I I feel like I've earned that credit. I'm going to stick to it. I'm happy about it. I think you were the first person to tell me um, that uh, quite rightly, that it's possible to make a perfectly decent living out of making films that never get made. That's right. Um, but but the, yeah, the vexing detail from that is when your films don't get made, you don't end up on the IMDb. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You got to keep your, your dreams reasonable, I guess. <laughs> reasonable. Uh, so, yeah. So I'm in there now. Thank you. But we have something else to celebrate, too, don't we? we we've reached uh, episode 50. In fact, we reached it last week and we said nothing about I it, know, which is well. so pathetic. So we, we, we've reached the milestone of episode <laughs> 51. <laughs> Happy 51st, man. <laughs> we've done it. And if you, if you guys are sick of hearing us and you want us to stop at 50, you better call in or email in fast because we're about to do number 51 right now. But but how how can people possibly contact us, Andres? Oh, oh, well, oh, the socials, the socials, that's right. Well, socials. I'm an email guy, so I know that you can get us at uh, 2 real cinema at uh, gmail, 2 real cinema club at gmail.com. Blog is 2 real cinema club. Uh, dot com Instagram two real cinema club at Instagram dot com on Twitter at two real cinema club at Twitter dot com. Tell your friends you'll find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and on YouTube. Jimmy, that was the smoothest transition. You made it so smoothly, and then I just <laughs> screwed it up. But find us. Look for it. if you just pop two real cinema club in somewhere, you're definitely going to find us. Um. This episode we have found, um, so uh, it's no donkey related pictures, but it is horses. We are looking yeah. at um, Women Talking, uh, which is a new Sarah Polly film uh, nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. So this is right in our wheelhouse and comparing it to uh, 1988's um, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. So going back to Al Modavar, mm -hmm. um, who's uh, one of our old favorites on the club. Yeah. Uh, so exciting. These two films um, uh, superficially have enough in common that they both have women in the title. And I think when you look at them from a bit of a distance, you think, eh, I'm not sure these two films have much more in common than that. But I yeah. think when you start peeling back the layers, these these films make a really interesting pairing. So you've, you've chosen a great pair this time around. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and these are what, 34 years apart, something like 88 to 2022. Yeah, so they're definitely, um, boy, I don't even know if Sarah Polly is 34 years old. She might be a little older than that, but yeah, she would have been a tiny kid when Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown came out. She was um, she was a tiny kid when she was in um, Adventures of well, Acting. In, it was, yeah. was Baron Munchausen, wasn't yeah. it? She was in Baron Munchausen. Yeah. You know, and that was only probably three or four years before. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. So yeah, she was a tiny toddler back then. So, uh, women talking, 2022, let me tell you the story. Uh, I'm going to start the synopsis with a bit of a content warning as well. This uh, film features you know, a lot of explicit talk about sexual violence, and it won't be for everyone. So, the film is set in 2010, um, although it's far from obvious at the start of the movie, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's it's a film based on a true story about a women a group of women in a Mennonite colony um, in an unnamed country. Uh, in the real story, uh, the colony that the story is based on was actually in Bolivia. Um, but I think I did read. Uh, I think in some of the press that they said that this colony is in Canada. I don't know whether they specify that in the film. I don't think they do. So in this colony, the women of the colony, this Mennonite colony, um, find that they have been systematically drugged and raped by a number of men in the colony, and they're only now at the beginning of the movie figuring out what it is that has happened. This has been going on for years, uh, and they are faced with a choice. They have the choice to do nothing to stay and fight their attackers or to leave the colony and the only life that they have ever known. So uh, a representative group of the women in the colony meet in private in a hayloft without any of the men there, apart from one token man who takes uh, takes um, uh, minutes. Uh, and they talk to weigh up their alternatives and uh, try to come to a decision about what they're going to do before the men of the colony return from bailing out the attackers and bringing them back. Uh, I've got, I, I've got two very basic things to start out the conversation on this uh, over this movie. Um, one is, um, as a blanket comment, I thought it was terrific. Um, it has fantastic performances. A bunch of great actors in this movie. It's got it's Rooney Mara, Claire Foy. Jesse Buckley, Francis McDormand, a, a bunch of great um, actors in these roles. Um, it's engaging. It's absorbing. Um, I was glued to the screen, but uh, I have one straightforward complaint about this film, which is that I don't think it's a film <laughs> um, that I, I, we've talked about this before, that yeah. cinema is a story told through moving pictures. It, Hitchcock, um, who's a funny person to bring up in a discussion of a film about misogyny, but um, Hitchcock uh, said that, uh, you know, if a film gets it right, then even if all the dialogue is in a foreign language, you should still understand 80% of what's going on. Um, This film is, well, I I wrote down in my notes, this is a play, not a film, but actually it's, it's not even so much a play as like an illustrated radio play. It's only really one step away from an audio book. Yeah. Um, So even those elements which are cinematic, um, are narrated. Yeah. Uh, so quite early on, there's this recurring theme where uh, one of the women of the colony talks about her two horses in this kind of horse team that she has that takes her carriage around. And when she talks about the horses, we get like, you know, a little sort of vignette of her with the horses yeah. uh, riding along her carriage. But all the way through, she is telling you this story about her with her two horses. Um, even the things which are visual are described. I think um, it's almost like the opposite of Hitchcock's suggestion. Yeah. So in this movie, if you could not see the screen for 80 percent of the time, you would still entirely understand everything that was going on in the movie. I mean, I think you could. Yeah, you could watch yeah. this movie with your eyes closed. And I think you would get about as much from it. Yeah. Good point. Um, that's not to say that it's bad. I think it is outstanding, but I don't think it's quite cinema. But I hate, to, I hate to start on a bummer because I think it's an outstanding picture and uh, it, it hasn't been widely seen. I hope it will be seen more widely now yeah. that it's up for the Oscar. We'll see what happens in a couple of weeks. Um, I agree I'm with you. I'm really I, glad that okay. I went to see it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. no I, I'm finished. Oh, I was about to interrupt. <laughs> 
Now I fully right. interrupted. <laughs> Let me get back into a sentence so you can interrupt me properly. What were you going to say? You once said that we have to interrupt each other more, so I'm just following your advice. Um, I'm going to agree with you. Stop. I, I'm, <laughs> Carry on. Oh, the stand-up comedians, you just can't keep up <laughs> with them. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, it's, almost, it's It was a book, correct? I think it was a book. Um, so it's, it's been developed from a book by Miriam Taze, I believe is her name. Um, yeah. And it sort of skips right over theater and becomes film. And I, I agree with you entirely. Um, it does break all the Hitchcock rules. Um, and th the first five or ten minutes are phenomenally visual. Um, it's great filmmaking. You don't, you don't, yeah. you, and, but there's narration from the outset, from the very first frame, basically there's narration. So you're, yeah, you're seeing the story, you're seeing the story world, but you're also getting a lot of the backstory, um, as opposed to seeing it. And I think uh, we'll talk about this later. I'm sure there, you, n there's nary a man's face in this film other than August, who's the teacher who's recording it. And I think, that's a big disservice because I think there's, as a result, there's sort of no antagonist and they're having these wonderful conversations about God and power and um, toxic masculinity and male power and such. Um, but it does sort of get lost in all conversation. The most active characters are those two horses, Cheryl and Ruth, that you talk about. They're, I mean, they're the ones who are doing the most action. Um, so it, it seems really well suited for theater. I, I, I could see her turning it into a play. Um, after the fact, but I think it should have been a play first and then possibly you could get a movie out of it. But um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's pure cinema by any means. And it's a little, when you talked about the the story world, I was a little bit disjointed because it, I don't know if it matters where it is, but it was filmed in Canada. Um, it feels like an American story. We have a lot of these colonies in the United States as well. Um, and then they're looking at the Southern Cross at one point. So you're thinking it has to be in New Zealand, Australia, ah. South Africa, or maybe Bolivia. Maybe that maybe that was just left in there. Um, so you really have no idea where you are, which I think it, it would help to have a world within a, in a world because you, you already don't know what time period it is. You have no idea what technology is going on due to the na nature of the community. Um, so you feel, I felt particularly lost Um as a result. So I think it would help, um, but I don't think that's the, the overlying um, critique I would have. I agree with you 100%. I think it's just, it's not um, cinematic. There's some beautiful shots, there's beautiful photography, um, and it's beautifully acted, but it doesn't feel like a real cinematic film. Um, so I'll leave it there. I'll let you interrupt me now. But as, as, as is the tradition with the Two Real Cinema Club, I've read the book. Actually, oh. I, I finished it this afternoon before we recorded. it. Um, and the book is terrific. Uh, the book is very short, as it seems to be the pattern oh, really? with all of these books that we've kind of read recently really? that have been adapted into films. This is my advice to anybody who wants to write a movie, a book that gets picked up to be turned into a film. Yeah. Keep it short because they're all short. People don't like to read. Yeah. Um, the, the book is terrific. The film is... Um, uh, a very, very direct interpretation uh, of the book. A great deal of the dialogue is lifted straight from the book, and the okay. book is written almost in a dialogue form. It's a lot. There's a lot of reported street speech, but it feels like someone who is reporting a play that they are watching in front of them. Okay. So it's so it's um, dialogue heavy. Uh, again, very action light. Um, it's you know largely a, a, a rendering of a philosophical debate on the paper. There's very little that happens in the book that doesn't make it into the film. There are mm. a small number of tiny details towards the end that have been simplified, I think, okay. to, to just to, to um, make the arc a little bit more direct for the third act. But otherwise, you know, the film is very directly the film of the book. It feels like the book was, you know, open on the laptop of, of, of uh, or on the lap of Sarah Polly when she was shooting the film. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. Um, it's interesting what you say about the whole kind of sense of place. Yeah. I am just not clever enough to pick up on that Southern Cross thing. But yeah. yeah, there is a scene where August, who's the teacher, he teaches the women how to navigate uh, by the Southern Cross because they've never left the colony in, you know, during their whole lives. They've never had to look at a map. They've never had a map to look at. Yeah. Um, and this notion that the, cross, uh, the Southern Cross being that the... the the North Star that they orientate themselves around gives it a sense of place. Um, I didn't notice that, I'm afraid, too thick. But I think this nature of the film being a bit shift, or at least a little bit non-specific about its place in the world and its time in the world, it's both specific and non-specific, isn't it? There's specificity insofar as a van that's taking the 2010 census drives around one afternoon. Yeah. And that you know gives the, the film a very specific sense of time. But it's um, 
also taking place in a community where time is effectively stopped 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, all of these elements, I think, give the film a really kind of allegorical flavour, um, which I think I think is is what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, it's about. I, I think the film primarily works as an allegory. Um, to, to the extent I was surprised after watching it to learn how much of it is based on a true story, because um, it feels like you know these uh, women who are enclosed in in this isolated community, um, really they're stand-ins for all women on the earth. It's like the isolated community is society as a whole, and I think you know the, the film really lends itself to that kind of um, that, that kind of allegorical representation. Yeah, I agree. And it's um, all women, all millennia. These are problems that have been going on for hundreds of and even thousands of years. So I think that's what makes it so relevant is that these are issues that uh, we're still dealing with and sadly we will be dealing with. So it, it, it's very, very poignant in that way. I agree with that. Uh, weirdly, the film it reminded me of, um, strangely, is Fight Club, uh, which is also... Like a like a reflection of toxic masculinity. That film was kind of released before we had a word for toxic masculinity. Yeah. Um, and the, the other film it kind of reminded me of, and this is you know like a pretty stupid take, and you're welcome to quote me back, quote this back to me, and I'll cringe in the future. But it reminded me a bit of Cloverfield. Have you ever seen that? I did see it's, that. Yeah. It's, it's a science fiction film about um, you know this giant alien that smashes New York, which is like a very allegorical take on 9-11. Yep. Um, so this film is kind of so allegorical. It fits into that um, that kind of myth-like slot in my mind. Yeah. Um, and, and sits there very well, I think. Yeah, that, that'd be a, a strange triple feature, but maybe someone <laughs> would watch that. <laughs> um, standout performances for you? Yeah, I thought... Um, I was really impressed with Rooney Mara. Um, I thought... Is it Jesse Buckley... Her character was fantastic. Yeah, I think those two in particular really stood out for me. Um, I think Frances McDormand was there mostly just to attract money to the project. I think she's a producer on the film as well because she. It seems that just looking at it, it, looks like she was on set for a day or two, did a couple of things, um, sat in makeup for quite a while. Obviously, because she's clearly suffered. She's clearly scarred up from her battles with men in the community. But she more or less just leaves the decision making up to some of the younger women in the in the community. Um, I mean, she she is the most reactionary character, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. In some ways, she said it's, it's just always going to be this way. This is the way it was for me when I was a kid, and it's almost like, okay, you've got to go through it too. I mean, the, um, so she wasn't that sympathetic, was she? And even her daughter, she wasn't really protecting. She had two daughters who were uh, of younger age, and and maybe they would have been victims as well, or already had been. But um, she was more or less just, you know, let's stay with the course. This is the way it is. I'm, I'm going to ring the spoiler bell here, oh, actually, oh, because okay. I think let's if we move on to the second half of the film, there yeah. is something okay. uh, worth discussing about her character. Let's ring the spoiler bell here. Cover your ears. Yep. yep. Oh, it is it is too loud, isn't but, it? But it's perfect perfect for all these agricultural films we've been doing. <laughs> it's a great bell. It's good to have a bell. Yeah, like get that. the harvest in. Um, one thing I made a little note of in my uh, notebook here um, after watching the film was that. Um, there's, I would say, there's very little character development in this film. We have a whole bunch of characters who state their points of view and they argue the toss. But um, at the end of the film, um, they kind of they kind of reach a consensus largely because they have to, because there's this sense of urgency. The men are coming back yeah. you know, by the time the, the sun comes up. And so, you know, they have to gather, gather everything together and get out of there. Yeah. Um, and it, I can't remember any very specific moments where one person has been persuaded into a new point of view. I think we have people who represent various points of view and they just stick to their guns all the way through. The only character I think who does show any character development is Frances McDormand's character insofar as she is reactionary and she is the one who says we need to forgive the men and maintain the established order. But at the end of the film, she silently, I think, gives yeah. her blessing to her own daughters who join the caravan and leave the colony. Yeah. So I think she may be the only person on screen who has genuinely changed her mind about something over the course of the film, even though she is not present for the the discussions themselves. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's true. 
Um, and it is quite silent. I think shortly before – you're given one of these sort of um, uh, turns of, of plot in the sense that I think shortly before she does allow them to go, she actually holds them back briefly. It seems like they're going to go on their own. She holds them back. And then finally when they're um, sort of lining up the all of the carts and, and leaving the community, she lets them uh, board one of the carts and, and go on their way. So It's worth talking a little bit more about – so you're right. There is one – male character who's august ben wishaw yeah um and it's an interesting decision that the the story the events of the story are kind of seen through his eyes he's the only sympathetic person in the colony who can read and write Mm -hmm. and so he is then charged with writing down the minutes and drawing up lists of pros and cons for whether the women should leave or whether they should stay and so we kind of see the movie through his eyes. His character, um, this is one of the few differences between the book and the film. His character doesn't get very much explanation in the film. And there's mm-hmm. a significant, uh, significantly more backstory for him in the book. Um, what did you make of Ben Wishaw's character? Um, I thought it was interesting because they'd, they'd asked him to come in and sort of record things and write. And he does some drawing a little bit on this like chart paper or something like that. Um, yeah. But as you just said, I'm not sure that the women ever learned how to read. And yet from time to time, they would sort of contest what he had written down. So I was I was getting mixed messages because I was under the impression that he was a school teacher only for the boys. Yeah. So he, he would have known some of the young – he would have known people from being in the community. And, and there's sort of this uh, hint that maybe he and the Rooney Mara character um, had had this sort of um, – uh, unrequited love or this sort of love that they couldn't act upon because it would have been inappropriate in some way. Um, And yet he would have only taught the boys. So the girls, as far as we know, the women, as far as we know, haven't had any schooling at all. So he was writing things down. And originally it was, I guess, so he could read things back to them so that they could hear things and then process them again, which again, in in cinema, that's sort of like, uh, that's a no-no. We don't really want to hear something and then see it being written down, which isn't too cinematic, and then have (laughs) someone read it back to us later on. Um, So you're sort of setting yourself up for all these sort of traps along the way in terms of making it into a really engaging visual uh, piece of art. Um, but he, he was really just sort of, uh, I think he was the one foil and the one, I, th- I think he complicated their whole process in, in, in a good way because he was a decent man. He's, yeah. he's not this boisterous, super masculine, um, man. He's actually, uh, very patient. He occasionally has some points that he wants to chip in, but he, you know, at times the women cut him off and say, no, you know, you're not here to give your opinions. You're here just to record things down. Um, but he's a good guy. And they're not used to that. And I think that sort of brings a little bit of tension and it brings some nuance to the whole proceedings because they're not alone, isolated as a woman, as, as a group of women. There is one man there. Um, and even though he doesn't have an opinion or a vote on what happens, he definitely um, you know, plays, plays some part and influences them a little bit. And he doesn't leave with them, does he? And I'm not entirely sure why he doesn't, but... You know, I think the 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 implication is that he'll be there to be a great influence on the next generation. Maybe he can change them somehow, or he can forge them into a better men. Uh, but it, it sort of leaves you sort of unsatisfied because you feel all this love between him and Rooney Mara in the film, and it feels like they should be a couple. And oh, she's already pregnant, for, perhaps, right? Yeah, yeah. I think she's already. She, yeah, she's yeah. already pregnant. Yeah. Um, so you know, there was this chance that you know she would have a family with him, but. Um, it was, I was a little bit disappointed that he doesn't go along on a trip, but you know, there's, there's some things in this film that, um, aren't so logical and I kind of got hung up on those. Um, I think it's a great film. I think it's super relevant as we've just said. Um, I'm glad that she made it and that she got it made. It's, it's not something that I think I could make or ever imagine or even execute. So I'm really happy that it's out there. Um, but I have to confess that I misunderstood something from the very beginning, and it made my experience of the film probably a lot better than it would have been otherwise. So my ignorance uh, became kind of blissful in the sense that I was under the understanding that there were at least some men on the farm in the community at that time. Um, Because I just can't buy the fact that all of the men would go to town to bail this guy out. I think if it's a community that's this uh, toxically masculine and run by men, they're not going to leave all these women alone for a day or two. Um, so I couldn't believe that. So, And I didn't know that. 
I thought okay, there's some guys out there somewhere. So there was menace in my viewing of the film. I thought, okay, th- I was I was ah. nervous the whole way through because I thought, shit, someone's going to hear them or someone's going to walk into this or someone's just going to un- interrupt the whole proceeding. So I was under the impression that there was menace out there, that there was danger of them being discovered. And that made my appreciation of the film totally different. I was, I was, I was equally let down by the end when I realized, oh, there are no men there. This is the easiest <laughs> discussion they're ever going to have, even though it's so, uh, you know, such a dangerous conversation to have. Um, and that was just, I think, you know, that bit of information was totally exposition in the beginning. There were, there were a few images where the, um, I guess the whole thing's written from the point of one of the, the younger women who's writing a letter to Rooney Mara's child in the future, something like that, right? Yeah, I think so. It may, even be, may possibly be Rooney Mara writing it to her own yeah, child it could in the be. future. So a lot of that, it came out, the whole explanation of how all the men had to go to town, it seems very convenient. You're just sitting, setting, you're not showing it, you're setting it up, you're just telling us that that happened. And I was just probably writing a note in the dark at the time when that piece of information was revealed and it just went right over my head. But as a result, I went through this film quite tense and I don't think anyone else who understood the story was <laughs> tense while they were watching this film. So for me, it turned out to be a big... Uh, a plus, but at the same time, it's a massive letdown because I just realized that um, they were really never in much danger, and then they they get away so easily at the end too. I just think that you, I understand not wanting to have the faces of men or show any of the sexual violence in this film, but I think you need more menace to make the whole uh, proceeding much more urgent. And their getaway is so comfortable. I, I, again, towards the end, I was still thinking, oh, they're guys, they're just going to come out and stop them, but no, they were lining up this what. Quarter mile long train of carts and caravans, <laughs> yes. and doing it on their own gingerly time, and they're waiting for Ruth and Cheryl, the old horses, to get the thing going. And I thought, you know, they're going to get a couple hundred feet, and then they're just going to get discovered and probably, you know, physically abused for trying to do this escape. And um, so for me, I had a completely different feel for the whole film, and uh, I think that obviously it shows how stupid I am, but <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it just goes to show you, I think that antagonism is just something you have to incorporate somehow. And I think this film lot, the misses, it lacks a lot of antagonism. So the stakes, while I thought they were so hard, high the whole way through, they're really, the stakes are just not very, very um, high. It was not really a, it was not an, this is not a nail biter. I think you could agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I suppose you are right. I guess it shows that um, Sarah Polly has got a very definite idea of what she's interested in. Mm-hmm. And maybe having the, you know, the threatening men, you know, staring in from the outside of the barn or yeah, you know, um, would then kind of just turn it into a bit of a sort of, you know, torture porn slasher kind of um, groove, yeah, which is you know, not what the film is about. Um, so I, I can see how, um, yeah, th- that tension can inform your enjoyment of the film. Yeah. Um, but I can also see why Sarah Polly has deliberately you know, engineered yeah. this kind of, yeah, not very believable situation because it, it becomes more like, it, it's, it's like, um, you know, it becomes the Greek forum or something, doesn't it? It becomes yeah. people exchanging ideas yeah, precisely. You know, with the leisure to, to form their ideas very deeply. Yeah. And I suppose it would be difficult to believe those conversations, which yeah. is the meat of the film, you know, if you also had the, you know, the stalker waiting just outside the barn door. Yeah, I think there's, a, for me, there's a believability factor. I still just can't imagine that uh, a, a community that's ruled with such an iron-fisted uh, male hand um, would just leave the women alone for a couple of days. And it, it, it enables you to have this fantastic debate on the goods and bads of religion and um, the evil of men. But I just don't believe that they would let that happen. That's the thing. So I think yeah. it makes the whole story kind of unbelievable to me. But, it, you know, it does... As from a director's standpoint, it sets you up to have this great and very relevant and very necessary debate, um, but it doesn't make it really like a believable story. And it does; it it, it sort of drags as a film. As I said, it passed pretty quickly for me because I was under, I was just scared the whole time. <laughs> <But> <laughs> that's not going to happen for anyone who pays actually pays attention to the film. So I was doing a bad in, job. In the book, that third act, there's a couple of extra little elements, okay. which do. Um, give it a bit more tension. So at the end of the book, um, a couple of lads uh, from a neighbouring colony turn up. Oh. Um, And um, I think it turns out one of them has like a mobile phone. Yeah. 
Oh. Um, and so there is a chance that um, if uh, they don't neutralise these two lads, then they will oh. phone ahead oh. because you know there's this kind of big revelation that. Uh, in this Mennonite community, the guy who's the self, uh, self-crowned bishop, yeah. uh, who's called Peters, he has a mobile phone which he kind of keeps secret from everybody. Uh-huh. So, so there is this kind of tension and pressure in the book, and I'm, yeah, and I'm sure that probably would have been relatively cinematic. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's a very conscious artistic decision. Yep. Um, to you know, allow the film all the possible space to talk about the ideas and not crowd it out yeah. with you know, action or tension. The, the idea, the basic idea of the film, I know we often kind of talk about, well, what do you feel the themes of the film are? Um, you know, the basic, the basic message of the film is men be better, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's, you know, it's not like you leave the cinema with any controversy or any, or any question in your mind about, well, what was she really trying to say with this film? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's clear. But, and, but as you say, this is a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's very contemporary. It's vital. It's like geisty. Yeah. Um, it's a, sh- a shame it hasn't been in you, an enormous hit putting bums on seats. Yeah. I think uh, critically it's definitely been very successful and people are talking about it for sure. Um, and I think, I don't know if it's up for any awards or major awards and I don't know that that really matters anyway, but... Um, it, it's uh, it's, it's uh, got a nomination for Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. Okay. Um, which, and you know, and I can um, fully understand how, especially if you are a female actor and you get this script oh, yeah. from your agent, you must think, oh, fantastic. This looks great. Something yep. proper meaty for me to get my uh, get my chops into. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure it is a great script. I don't think the Oscar should be awarded on the basis of the amount of effort that has gone into turning a book into a script because, no. you know, this has been a pretty quick, straightforward transcription overall. Yeah. Um, so you know, it wasn't hard to adapt, but the script that has emerged from this adaptation is a really good one. Yeah, well, I wonder how many. I wonder how many. Look, I didn't read the book. You make me look bad all the time, <laughs> and I've been reading the same book for about four months. So <laughs> you make me look really bad. But um, I wonder how many people, you know, uh, the, of, of the the in the Academy both read the book and the script. So that's a it's kind it's of very a, few. Won't yeah. It? yeah, I think one one thing I wrote to myself, and this is just from a whole, you know, like a filmic cinematic perspective i just wrote you eventually have to see the shark yeah and obviously there's not gonna be a shark in this film but um there's i think you just need some kind of confrontation there there are some again they allude to a lot of um uh, confrontations with men and there are there's obviously violence going on in the community but um we don't see it at all and we don't see any that we don't even see the men like beating each other up or anything like that and i think you need you just need to see the shark a little bit and and, and I, but at the same time i i noted you know it's probably by design that we don't see that you don't this is really all about women talking which is both a really great title and a really bad title in some ways um but is, is the name of the book women talking it is, yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. Same yeah. title, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think it's probably by design. This is supposed to be a film where um, we really get this very open, honest form with this really um, specifically women's voices. You do get August in there a little bit to give you at least what a good guy would look like. But I think you need probably some more bad guy stuff somehow. I don't know. But, I mean, again, it's not that it's not my film and that's not the film she's trying to make. But I do have one question for you about August. Yeah. Um, and I hate to give too much attention to the only male character mm. um especially because you know he, he really kind of isn't super important to the ideas that are being presented but um there is an ambiguous scene that i was going to ask you about right towards the very very end of the film just as he is saying goodbye to the women who are going to go out in their caravan leave the community forever yeah um it transpires that he has a gun yeah and he hands over the gun and there's this kind of question of um uh, one of the women asks him, August, why have you got a gun? And he kind of bursts into tears. Um, and it's kind of quite sweet. But how did you interpret that scene? Because I had I had a specific interpretation. Having read the book now, I think my yeah. interpretation was wrong. But I'd be interested to know what you thought it meant or how it came across. I figured that he would have to take his own life because he would be um, threatened by the men. Who come back? Ah. They were gonna, you know. Look, you let them leave. Uh, you were the you were the one guy we left behind. Or um, how could you make this happen? Why did you facilitate this sort of thing? And that he would probably have to take his life, or he might take his own life just out of 
frustration that he's losing potentially his, his the love of his life is leaving and all these women are leaving and he's going to be stuck in that community. Um, he might have to defend his life, I guess, because maybe the men would be um, so angry with him that he would have to kill someone. I mean, and then he ends up giving it to the to Claire Foy's character, I believe. Yeah. Is that how that ends up? Yeah. Um, what about the book? What about your perspective on that? Well, when I saw the scene, I, I interpreted that, that um, maybe August had also been raped. It was what I was thinking. Oh. And so, and so, you know, he kind of got this gun to defend himself. Oh. Uh, that was the way that I saw it. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Having read the book. Yeah. Um, uh, from you know before the story starts august has this plan that he's going to take his own life oh. i think because he feels an outcast yeah um and his mother had yeah. died i don't know how recently but he did he seemed a little depressed uh, throughout the film as well so yeah exactly in in the in the book he um uh, it's implied that he may be the illegitimate son of the the bishop of the community oh and um, that you know, he and his whole family were expelled and excommunicated when he was twelve years old. Yeah, I think so that the bishop could hide that this was actually his illegitimate son. Yeah, um, and he's been kind of you know ostracized and um, you're treated very badly by the the men of the community since he has returned. Yeah, but yeah, but um, I think there's nothing in the book to suggest that he is also a victim of sexual violence. But that that was the way that I saw that just when it uh, flashed up on screen yeah. there, which I thought was an interesting take, but. But I think I was wrong. That did not occur to me. But definitely, I mean, suicide was definitely the thing that uh, came immediately to mind. Now, this is normally uh, that time in the show when we pick up the phone oh, yeah. uh, and we make a call to the Cliché Squad. But uh, any reason to call the Cliché Squad this week? Cliché Squad. Jeez, I don't think so. That's a... Uh... That's a badge. Of, that's a badge of honor right there. Isn't it? <laughs> it's not. That might, a, might be one of our very first. I think. Yeah, Absolutely. Maybe around horses. Are there some horse cliches? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. We are. We are scraping the bottom of the wow, barrel. I think this film are. has managed to avoid cliches. Certifiably um, donkey free and certifiably cliche free. This episode fifty one, the best ever. Not bad. Not bad. Um, so overall, I I suspect off the back of a bit of Oscar. Buzz, yep. women talking. You know, I hope it will get a few more views. I hope because it deserves um, to be a bit of a cultural phenomenon. It raises yeah. questions that we really, really should be talking about. Yeah, um, men, we have to do better. Yeah. Um, let's let's hold that thought <laughs> and let's go to an ad. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say one more thing is that I think. Um, oh yes, oh please, I agree please. with you. It should get more views. Um, this is a really intellectual film, which is curious because the women are very, very wise, even though they haven't had any schooling from even August, right? So it's um, it's actually a very it's a it's a talky picture, as we've said. It's it's a smart picture, um, and that yeah. is it's it's nicely surprising, but also I think a lot of American film goers anyway. You guys in the UK are better read. Clearly, you read books and stuff. Um, but uh, I think it probably would go over the heads of a lot of Americans and just questioning God in any way um, in a religious culture like our own. It's uh, it's a challenging film, I think, and, that it's, oh, and it should be challenging, and I enjoyed the challenge. I'm glad that I'd misunderstood it at the beginning because it made it uh, – even more uh, exciting experience for me, but um, yeah, it's it's a must. It's kind of a must see film. I hope it happens. I hope it gets more uh, viewers. But uh, who knows? If not, it feels yeah. It's been so little seen that there yeah. hasn't even really been a backlash. There hasn't been enough momentum for there to be a backlash against it. I know. Yeah, that's sad. So yeah, absolute shame. Um, okay, let's. We'll have a break. Yeah, and then we will come back and we will talk about uh, women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Two Real Cinema Club is brought to you by the great people at Tube Eat. We get it. <laughs> Life is complicated these days. We're all on the go all the time. And the last thing we want to do when we get home is prepare a meal for the whole family. But at Tube Eat, we are problem solvers. Unlike some of the other food facilitation players out there, you know them. They have names like Green Chef, Purple Carrot, Blue Apron, <laughs> Hello Fresh, Fresh Chef. Do they all sound the same? 
Yes, they do. <laughs> do their names reflect their service? No. They're misleading know-nothings. At Two Beat, our mission is in our name, and our nutrition gets into your veins fast. We understand you. Like you, we hate going to a grocery store, studying labels for dozens of brands selling the same crap. It's time-consuming and resource-intensive. We hate unpacking the groceries and all the time lost to food preparation and cleanup. We hate the environmental costs of our food choices, land lost to grazing, cows farting, wasted resources in oil and water use, animal cruelty, and transport and supply chain issues. Unlike our and donkeys and donkeys, yeah, yeah. And oh donkeys. no, we're good to the donkeys. We like the donkeys. Unlike our competition, we aren't contributing to your weekly garbage stream with cardboard, plastic, styrofoam, and those awful dry ice bags. Tube Eat isn't stuck in the past because we already have our minds and stomachs in the food future. All of our meals are pre-mixed and ready to go directly from our eco-plastic feed bags into your Tube Eat receptacle port. The initial outpatient surgery is safe, fast, painless, and easy. And best of all, we pay for it up front and bill the minor costs to you into your, I'm sorry, in your monthly billing. Our meal replacements are all on the cutting edge of synthetic reality. We use the finest of plant-based meats, so they are all certified vegetarian, vegan, free of animal cruelty, sustainable, and most important, delicious. That's right. They're delicious because at Tube Eat, even though we are far into the future, we haven't left your taste buds behind. Each meal comes with a flavor packet you just pop into your mouth while your food is uploading. <laughs> and downloading features easier, more comfortable digestion with virtually no constipation. Steak and fries, <laughs> macaroni and cheese, peanut butter and jelly, fish and chips, all of your favorite combinations are still available. Just much less trouble, and now they're really inextricably paired. With our mixes, you won't be able to tell one from the other. <laughs> Tube Eat has become so popular at home that thousands of restaurants across the world are starting to serve up us serve us up in house. The astronauts are enjoying us in space. We are astronomical gastronomy and we really are the future of eating without even eating. <laughs> And keep your mouths watering for an announcement of our forthcoming partnership and merger with our good friends at Iliostomy Associates. <laughs> to beat or not to beat, that is the real life or death question for all your future nutritional needs. It's probably a spoof. It it's, yeah, it's not that far off, is it? Oh, God. <laughs> And we are back, and we're going to talk about uh, Pedro Almodovar's 1988 film, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. Um, this is based on a Jean Cocteau one-act play turned into an operetta by Francis Poulon. Crazy. Did you know that before you saw this I, I I did not know that until three or four seconds ago. I thought this was a completely original story. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's a very, I don't, I don't know the one act play, but it's about a woman who's on a phone in a room the entire time. And I think she plays a number of different characters. Um, and it's, it's just a one act. So it's a short operetta sort of thing. Um, but it, it did change the way I thought about it. I mean, even just seeing it again for the first time in decades, um, it feels very theatrical. It feels, feels very much like a play. Um, you could do the I whole guess. thing in Peppa's house. I think you could do the whole film right there if you wanted to. So it's it, we've been talking so much about theater and cinema lately that this is actually probably – I always think of short stories, as you just mentioned, with women talking. Short stories, short books, or short plays really work well if you expand them into a film. And I think he yeah. does succeed in this um, – Sadly, maybe I don't know. Uh, it's, I think I've seen that it's going to be a TV series here soon as well. Because ah, when I mean, it, it is currently a musical, I think it yeah, may be on, been on, on on stage in London at the moment. Yeah, so, like it's made that made that that transition in the opposite direction. Yeah, so many different lives. So, I mean, again, I think uh, as we just talked about women talking, I think that would be a great play, and I think maybe it would bring a, a new angle and find a, uh, even a wider audience if that were a play. But um, it contrasts pretty 
pretty um, starkly with women talking because, as you said, she's taking a book and condensing it into a film that probably should have been a play. This is actually just sort of taking a short play that I had never heard of before um, and expanding it into a film. It still feels very theatrical, and I think there are very there are strong reasons for that. This is a fairly early Almodovar film. In this some is way, the thing that first brought him to international prominence, really. I, isn't I it? think so, but he had been he had been making films for about ten years before that. I think his first credits go to nineteen eighty or even the late seventies, mm. um, and. Um, I think it works. There, there are a couple of moments where I thought, "Oh, this looks like a, like a student film by today's standards." But a st- students who had access to a really nice studio, because her apartment <laughs> is really a set, and obviously they built something uh, of quite an ast- extravagant apartment that she lives in her penthouse. But um, they certainly built a, a beautiful set where most of the action takes place. As I said, um, apparently there was enough tension between Almodovar and Carmen Maura, who plays Peppa, the lead, um, during and after the film that. They had already done, I think, about five or six films together. It would be 18 years before they worked on another film, which ah. would have been Volver in 2007. So um, that tension made it maybe made it a good film, though. It's uh, a lot of fun. I remember seeing this probably shortly after it came out. So this is about 34 years ago. I probably saw it yeah, around that time. And I'm guessing all the stars in this film are reasonably well-known faces in the Spanish-speaking world. Yeah. It looks that way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Antonio Banderas has a part as Carlos, sort of the uh, the son of Peppa's uh, lover or her partner. You know, right? Yeah. I'll just get right into it. I think maybe I should do that. Yeah, tell, tell, me, tell me about it. Opposed to delaying, let's get the action going. Uh, it takes place in Madrid, um, and. Uh, the character, the main character, is really Peppa, played by Kalman Maura. She is a um, the partner of, or the I guess they, yeah, they're they're not married, I don't think, but partner with Ivan, and they both work in uh, the film dubbing industry. They're dub- dubbing films into Spanish. Um, that's where they're partners, but they're also partners in real life. They have this beautiful Madrid penthouse. Until he announces to her by phone message that he is leaving her and traveling with another woman. Um, Ivan is sort of on the loose for most of the film, and Peppa's just trying to track him down. She has to tell him something that is related to a doctor's visit. She's learned something with a doctor, um, and she needs to track him down and tell me, tell him uh, what what's going on with her. Um, there's a spoof ad, Jimmy. Our fans will love this. <laughs> There I had for- this, there's at least there's two spoof ads, isn't there, or more? Uh, there's definitely one. The one I remember is the deter- laundry detergent, <laughs> because Peppa apparently has played the mother of this killer on a Spanish television show, so she's very recognizable to people. Um, but in the ad, in the spoof ad, the police come to her door. They can't connect the son's bloody clothing as evidence <laughs> to any murders because the ter- detergent is just so darn good. good. Uh, it's a great spoof ad. It reminds me of uh, why we do spoof ads, right? <laughs> This is we, we aspire to that. Uh, Peppa's friend Candela has accidentally fallen in love with a, a Shiite terrorist, and she <laughs> needs to hide out at Peppa's place, which uh, Peppa's trying to rent it because Ivan has moved out, so she's trying to get a, a renter. Um, in the process, Peppa starts stalking Ivan's ex-wife. So at, f- at first I was a little confused because I thought Ivan was still married or still with his wife, um, but... It's clear that she's an ex-wife, and uh, Peppa learns of uh, Ivan's son, Carlos, played by Antonio Banderas. Um, this becomes sort of a major uh, contrivance because Carlos and his girlfriend are looking for an apartment, so they end up looking at Peppa's apartment, and they once they get there, they just never leave, really. Um, <laughs> But I think the effect is he's trying to reduce his story world. So uh, Almodovar is trying to get everyone in one place. And that's why it starts to feel very, very stagey, very thin, uh, yeah. theatrical as a result. But it's it's kind of brilliant. Um, this film, I should say, was made for about $700,000. So it's not a ton of money uh. even then. So it's just very, very smart, very savvy to get the whole story world together in one place. I mean, it has the feel of quite a tight farce, doesn't it? It's t- it's a total farce. I mean, this could. I'm not surprised. It's a musical. It would make a great farce on stage, and uh, I think you could. Yeah, there are definitely some great songs that could come out of it. The, the gazpacho just has to be a great song in that musical. <laughs> right? um, in her, uh, I was just about to talk about that. In her apartment, there's this blender, sort of flask full of tranquilizer. I think she says barbiturates. <laughs> um, it, this the, the gazpacho is laden with uh, the barbiturates um, that Peppa 
has prepared. I guess originally it was look, she wanted to prepare it to Avon to get him to come and drink it and stay there. I, at one point, I wasn't sure if she was suicidal, if she was willing to to drink the this gazpacho um, herself. Um, but um, it's there, and the gazpacho plays a pretty big part. Um, Peppa gets excellent taxi service um, from this uh, thrice reappearing taxista. So again, another contrivance to have one uh, taxi driver and he, he even has a little story in an arc of his own over the three journeys they have. Uh, the first time that taxi driver turned up, I thought it was Almodovar. No, it was not. Um, Did, does he deliberately look a bit like he him? He does or look is a little it, bit is like just, him. Yeah. Is that purely in my eyes? He's had some cameos in some films. I went back and looked at some trailers, and he's definitely in a number of them. But yeah, at, at first I thought the same thing, but no. Oh, not just me then. No, 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 no. Um, Peppa needs a lawyer to help defend uh, her friend Candela, who's having problems with the um, the Shiite terrorists, who we never see. We talked about seeing the shark. Uh, we never see them, which might be a good thing, but... Um, they're out there. Uh, Peppa ends up seeking the assistance of uh, feminist lawyer Paulina Morales, um, who happens to be, you guessed it, Ivan's new lover. There's finally this massive convergence of characters, uh, including some policemen investigating um, some of the things that are going on, especially with the Shiite terrorists. Um, Ivan's ex-wife ends up at uh, Peppa's house to confront her. Uh, there's a telephone repair man who gets there, but doesn't last long because there's this massive gazpacho toast that tranquilizes most of the characters um, just before Peppa and Ivan's ex-wife Lucia have sort of a tete-a-tete, mano-a-mano, gazpacho and gun standoff. Uh, a wild ride to the airport ensues with Peppa on the back of uh, some neighbor's boyfriend's uh, motorcycle and... Uh, <laughs> Lucia firing gunshots at her. This is a comedy. It is very funny. I really like seeing this movie again. Um, so she ends up saving Ivan from his crazy ex-wife, um, which is a little uncomfortable in this day and age of blaming violence on the mentally ill or only mentally ill uh. women in particular. But I don't know. It's it's so well set up that, okay, it makes sense. But uh, it might be a little less uh, okay these days. Um Finally, when Pe- Peppa gets back to her, her very sleepy apartment, everyone's passed out on the gazpacho. She confides to um, Carlos's soon-to-be ex-girlfriend uh, that she is indeed pregnant. The one person who's actually awake is the one person who's been sleeping for most of the film. Um, <laughs> and they have this little tete-a-tete at the end, and um, she says that she's pregnant. So that's the news. It's not clear that she's ever going to tell that to um, Ivan himself because she actually went to the airport more to save him from being shot. Um, and we never, I think they were supposed to be on the Peppa, oh no, I'm sorry, Ivan and Paulina Morales, the new girlfriend, were going on this same flight to, where was it? It was, Bru- it was uh, Brussels? I forget where it was. It'll come back to me. Um, yeah, I, w- I want to say Bolivia, but I don't know whether that's because I'm now confusing it with I think women. You are. <laughs> they were, fl- I think they were going to be on the same flight as the Shiite terrorists. But oh, yeah, the, the, they, yes. They kind of, he kind of leaves that little bit of the story at the very end. He doesn't pay much attention to it, and the city will come back to me. But it was a European city, um, so she's really more interested in saving him, maybe to make sure that the baby has a father, even if it's a distant, estranged father. Um, the baby's father will still be around. So that's it. I was trying to be. You've been so concise with your, <laughs> with your summaries of films lately. I had to travel. I challenged myself to ten sentences, and I made some pretty long sentences. But I think it's ten or less. <laughs> Henry James, eat your heart out. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I, I had never seen this film before. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, and I, I am. I enjoyed it enormously. It's a riot. Yeah. It's very rare that I watch a film and I genuinely can't guess what's going to happen next. Oh, good. And this is absolutely this film, isn't it? It goes yeah. to so many crazy places. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it never sits still for 90 seconds. No. So I'm not surprised that this is the film that then catapulted not just a model of all, but I guess Antonio Banderas as well into international attention. Yeah, he'd been in a couple of films. So a Motivar probably has five or six, like, significant films before this. So uh, I think as soon as uh, probably 80, 81, 82, he's already a pretty good name in in Spanish cinema. And he's got some films where um, Banderas was already in um, Law of Desire, um, Dark Habits came before this, Matador came before this. Mm. And Banderas was in, I think, most of those. Yeah, he's definitely in Law of Desire. Um, 
And Carmen Mara, I mean, Carmen Mara is, uh, she was already 30. I can't believe this. She's 35 or 40 in this film. She was born in 45. She's 43 in this film. Is that right? Wow. Um, she does not look that at all. Um, so they'd already made a number of films. I And he'd already sort of um, established some patterns of just these, yeah, these wild contrivances that really set up great stories, setups and payoffs all over the place. Um, yeah. Just constantly giving us little pieces of information that we need for later. Um, really, really. And just uh, in terms of farcical writing, it's great. I mean, to the point where I think this makes a good film, even though it feels very stagey at times and it feels like theater. Um, the man's done two things at the same time. He's written a great play, I think, but he's also just made a good film from that great place. So I think uh, I'm not surprised that they want to pick it, make it into a series now or that it was a musical. It's just such a versatile piece of just good writing. Um, that just satisfies again and again. And you're right. I mean, you think it's an hour and 30 minutes almost exactly. It just yeah. breezes by. It's a real delight to watch. Um, I was kind of prepared for the color schemes that we see on screen. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of that kind of, yeah, typical amount of our color, which I was expecting. But I wasn't expecting quite such sophisticated cinematography from oh, this film, especially yeah. him. He loves he loves telephones. There's a lot of Hitchcockian oh, telephone yeah. calls yeah. Um, in this film. And and he loves kind of dividing the screen as well, either by using like, you know, the coloured awning of a telephone booth yep. or by literally drawing a line and splitting the screen into two different locations. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of quite sophisticated, interesting visual work going on. Yeah, he loves he loves machinery and the workings. He loves, and I think that goes on to the level of uh, mental machinations as well. He loves the machinery of ideas and inventions. So, um, the attention that he gives to what are now completely archaic phones and cassette tape <laughs> answering machines, he loves them. They're treated so lovingly. You know, he'll do these long, sort of panning, flowing shots of the technology. <laughs> Reminds me of some of the shots in, I think it was Talk to Her, where he's looking at IV tubing and um, I, drip bags and the, 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 the needles going into the veins and all that. He just loves to show all of that machinery, all these connections. And I think it extends into his storytelling because he's very much about putting together something that works, like a story that works mechanically. You can see all the lines coming together. You can see all the, the architecture of the apparatus. And it's, I think it's just his brain. And you get to see his brain on the film, especially in this film. I think it's really clear. I'll tell you one thing these two films have in common is they make a you know, a very interesting um, dramatic use of pregnancy. Mm. But, uh, you know, the, like the pregnancy here in, in Women on the Verge, um, so Pepper's pregnancy is kind of the motive for the entire film. Yeah. Even though it's, it isn't revealed until literally the last shot of the film. Yeah. But, you know, that's kind of the motive that's driving everything forward all the way through. And in the same way, Women Talking, um, Ona's pregnancy in that film, you know, it, it, it's a little bit like a you know a physical biological reminder of the ticking clocks that yeah. they have to make sure they need to hurry up and make their decisions. Um, I think the, it, it's they're both you know clever, intelligent use of pregnancy as a story device, and it's you know pregnancy is one of those really easy kind of story device one hundred and one yeah. sort of ideas. You know, oh, you know anybody can write a story where you know a character blurts out, "I'm pregnant," and everything changes. Yeah. Um, but both of these, use, these films use pregnancy very differently and in a very kind of mature, intelligent, interesting way. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, I think uh, Ona in Women Talking, it's almost like what's the, – the debate there is what's the fate of this child inside me? Is it going to be part of this male culture? Or are we going to get away and it's going to have a different – my child's going to have a different – uh, future or different possibilities, and then in so clearly taking it away from its male dominated community. Whereas Peppa, it seems like she wants at least Ivan to know that he's going to be a father. We don't know, you know, what his role in in rearing the child is going to be, but um, the child will at least know he has a father, probably know the father. Um, and that's kind of interesting because she's it's not insisting. It doesn't seem like she only wants him to know that he's going to be a father. He, she's not insisting on. Uh, like marriage and a, and a happy family setting, you probably couldn't get that from Yvonne anyway. So it's also acknowledging sort of the shortcomings of of men, but at the same time, there's an opening for possibly having a place in in the child's future, and but maybe not at the same time. So, a couple of different angles, yeah. Um, I got to super quickly pause because uh, Rachel's gone out to dinner and she has just come back. Oh, good. Uh, if I don't open the door, the dog will make a big old fuss. <laughs> you, but hold on for 30 seconds. Is that all right? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll entertain the listeners. So um, hello, everybody. Jimmy's 
you probably heard because Jimmy's left all of this in the podcast. So you know that he's going to get, go to the door. Rachel is his wife. She's coming home from dinner. It's pretty late. I don't know if you guys know this about uh, the Two Wheel Cinema Club, but uh, we usually record on a Monday afternoon. Sometimes we've done Tuesday. Um, after school for me here on the East Coast of the U.S., I can get home by 4 o'clock. We can start um, podding. That's what the podders do. They pod. Um, we can start potting at about 4 o'clock my time, very often 4.30. For for Jimmy, that's 9 o'clock or 9.30 at night. Um, so he's up pretty late. Right now it would be about 10.30 in uh, his time zone. So it's a, it's a late night for Jimmy. It's usually just a late afternoon for me. But uh, So Rachel's been out late, actually, because uh, dinner is uh, <laughs> kind of late. Oh, is, this, is, this, is this the ongoing commentary to fill I the was just, I was just telling the audience about how we <laughs> are in two different time zones. The lifestyles are different and such. And that also they want to know why Rachel's out at dinner at uh, 1030 at night or something like that. So <laughs> yeah, good. I, I want to know the answer to that as well. You're right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> There's an audience for that. There's an audience for everything now. <laughs> there are pods about absolutely nothing. I mean, uh, the bar is low. That's why we're having so much success in our 51st. Yes. Yeah, people people want the characters, not the facts. We, exactly. <laughs> we talked about the fatherhood, the pregnancy issues. Yeah, I think um, there's a great line from Peppa. She says, mechanics are easier than male psychology. I will never understand a man. So that was for me... Uh, <laughs> A great connection to uh, women talking as well, but uh, definitely one of the themes. And this is, again, we talked about mechanics just a few minutes ago. I think there there are a lot of mechanics going on. I mean, if you don't follow this story closely, you might not follow it at all because it does get a little chaotic. Um, and he'll, he, as you said, he'll follow storylines where, okay, maybe I'm following this well, or but I still don't know where it's going to go next. So that's, a, that's I think that's a good thing in writing. And it's kind of so tightly woven, isn't it? Um, yeah. I'm thinking of things like you know, we were talking about this, the, like the setups and the payoffs. Yeah. Even just like the you know the spoof ad, which looks like a throwaway gag. Yeah. Of two you know two policemen storming into yeah. uh, kind of Pepper's apartment, and then exactly the same thing happens in real life a little bit later on. You know, nothing is wasted. Yeah, to the point where I thought those were the same two act- <laughs> actors too, but they were. I had to go back and look at that. They're not the same <laughs> actors, but they're similar <laughs> enough where it just you immediately think back to the spoof ad. It's almost like he's paying backwards as well as forwards. It's just, it's lovely. Um, I did read that the title um, in English means something a little bit different to the title in Spanish. I think in in Spanish, um, the title is something like women having an attack of the nerves. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Uh, It's it's like this kind of Spanish cultural phenomenon, this idea of, you know, you kind of, you know, yeah, might get a bit of the shakes and then you have a faint or something like that. Yeah. And it's very different to this notion of being on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Yeah. I think it's it's part of the way that the, the the title has been translated into English. I think I think that's a big component of why it was a success internationally, because it's mm. such a great title. It is a great title. It is a great title. But I think Breakdown almost does a disservice because uh, Peppa's amped up. You know, she's actually very in a way, very coherent or very less, she's very active. She's an active protagonist. Um, so she knows what she's doing and she's got, she's kind of, you know, one step ahead of everything in the, in the film to a certain extent. Um, whereas uh, when I think of a breakdown, I think of someone who's just incapacitated. Yeah. Um, and at one, at one point when she burns the bed, you're thinking, okay, maybe she is <laughs> incapacitated, but, um, uh, no, she's actually a very active protagonist and she seems kind of clear minded. It's, it's chaotic. Clear, clarity, but uh, it's there. And you can tell when, I mean, I don't know if you've found this, that sometimes a good title is 60% of the work, isn't it? Mm. Once you can get a good title, if you get a title that captures pe- people's imagination, yeah, you know, people will meet you more than halfway you know, to, to, to realise that interesting title. And you know when you've got a great title, when you hear um, spoofs of it all out around the place. So I seem to remember for years after this film came out, um, there were riffs on this title, you know, in every possible um, uh, avenue that there would be like a television program about dogs on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> or there'd be, you know, some advert for shoes on the verge of a nervous breakdown. That yeah. It was just such a uh, a stealable little phrase. Yeah. I hate um, anyway, it. has yeah. this kind of sense of fun and, or, and you know, and, oh, it's, oh, it's to do with that Spanish film. It, it's just worked back in into the culture yeah. again and again and again. And I, I hate to belabor the point, but women talking... 
it doesn't sound like a film that's going to have a lot of action, obviously, or if it's not going to be that exciting. I don't know that I want to go to the theater to hear women talking, or men talking for that matter. It'd be an even worse film if it were called Men Talking, obviously. Um, but I think that, that title does, maybe, maybe it doesn't do the book a disservice, but I think because cinema is really not supposed to be a talky uh, media, yeah. I think that does a disservice to the film. And as you said, it's super important. I hate to say it, but yeah, maybe it is 60% of the thing. And maybe that, the, that title is going to turn people off from that film. I feel like the title Women Talking is it's they've come up with that title basically to troll misogynists, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so I think it really works well on that level. Yeah, but yeah. I agree it does it does the film a bit of a disservice. Well let's uh, let's should we try and kind of we've already been working on this. Let's try and yeah. draw the two films together with a bit of a synthesis. Yeah. For me, the first thing I'm going to say is um, I'm going to talk about contrivances because I think ah. – I'm not even sure if that's a word. Is that a word? Google. Yeah, it is now. Google has not corrected me on it. So uh, contrivances. <laughs> um, and I think you can get away with contrivances more in comedy – uh, because it's particularly about setups and payoffs and you're sort of drawing these comic lines. I think the contrivance in Women Talking for me is still the fact that there are no men there whatsoever. And that really sets up the film that she wants, but it doesn't set up a real um, believable film. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, yeah. And I think in drama, you just don't get the same benefit uh, of contrivances. We expect them in farce. So I think that's one connection that I would make um, – should I make a second connection? or do you Yeah, want... go on. Yeah, you're on a roll. Um, I think both directors intentionally shrink the story world. So they're, ah, yeah, if you yeah. watch Women Talking, most of it happens in that hayloft that you were talking about. And again, that's to make, that's a it's sort of a contrivance. You'd say, I'm, I'm going to make that happen in one space so that I can film the whole thing right there. And usually we think of that as being... Um, a a tactic that brings more tension because you're just compressing people into a small space and something has to happen. You can't escape the space, um, and that doesn't it doesn't work um, in women talking. You don't, and she's probably not looking for that kind of tension. She's looking for a really open debate, um, but you definitely get it in um, Almodovar. He starts out a bit more expansive, and film is supposed to be exp an expansive art form. You can go anywhere in terms of uh, moving across time and space. You can use dialogue. You can use art direction. You can use music, you use photography. It's an expansive media. And I think Almodovar sort of starts a little bit more expansive, but then he definitely compresses it down into the one space is mostly Peppa's penthouse, but it's a very narrow community. You're also just reducing characters to the point where it's about 10 or 12 total. Um, so I think um, I would I would start by talking about those contrivances and then just uh, shrunken story worlds. I think those are very very important um, tactics in both of the films. I mean the the strands. I mean you know the strands that the films have in common are, are fairly easy for me to kind of identify. Yeah. I mean they're both they're both about women in groups. They're kind of reacting to their kind of being controlled by the whims of men in a group or as an individual man. Yeah. Um, you know, neither film is very interested in the male characters. Um, you know, and fine. You know, the, the 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 camera and the story are interested in uh, the women who are the protagonists of the story. Yeah. Um, I, I think they both sort of have something to say about the way that women are treated, about you know, the, about the, the the tiny piece of the pie that women get and how they're expected to make do with the best of it. I thought the one kind of big difference. I thought that between the films, I came away from uh, women talking, feel like feeling like I had an extremely detailed drill into the status quo, and I you know had a, a long, thoughtful, fruitful conversation about what we see now. Yeah. Um, and then the film concludes with, "So we're moving away," but I felt like I, ca I came to the end of uh, "Women on the Verge," feeling like we'd also had a long conversation about. You know, what is the life of a woman like in the late 20th century, early 21st century? Mm -hmm. But I feel like somehow that film ends on a slightly more optimistic note as if it's actually got the, the, the it has a bit of a blueprint of how it might move on. The, the, the way that it ends with this note of a revealed pregnancy and an implied future 
um, I think just makes it feel like <sighs> women talking. It's it's talking about agency and independence, but uh, women on the verge is actually giving its characters um, agency and independence. Yeah, um, I kind of felt like that's they are that, that. So they they kind of come to a different end because of that. Yeah, I don't know if that really makes sense. I haven't explained that very clearly. I think it does. Um, and they're both about next generation without really doing it too explicitly. Um, I think like Pe yeah. Peppa's child is going to have a great time because she's such a great character. Um, and there is this there, – there's definitely a cynicism in the sense that you know that Yvonne's going to have probably three or four more girlfriends after the current one. <laughs> um, but as a, as a really solid independent woman, she's going to have no problem raising a child whether he's involved or not. Um, I wonder a bit more about uh, the community in, in – uh, women talking. I think that's sort of like the beginning of the story. That's one of those films that ends up with you're at the definitely at the beginning of the next story. And I guess you are in yeah. Women on the Verge as well. Um, but Ona has a baby. She's going to have a baby. And you wonder what that world's going to be like. It's obviously not going to be uh, a child who has access to its father. Um, and it'll probably be, you know, if, it, if it's, it's really a, a, a matriarchal community that it grows up in, when that's all the better. So, I mean, there's that is um, I think that's some optimism in that film. That's the it's hard to it's hard to extract that optimism in some ways. But if they get to another yeah. place and they're allowed to raise their their sons and daughters uh, the way that they want to, then that community will be better than the one they left. Yeah, got, to, got to allow the audience some hope, haven't we? <laughs> yes. Yeah, got to some hope. Yes. Um, and I, I, boy, I, for me, both films, they're must-sees. I mean, I, I really had a great time watching both of these films. Yeah. I had a lot of time in between them. The way our schedule worked out this time, it was probably three weeks, maybe even four weeks between watching the two. Um, but uh, I think they pair well, and I, I really enjoyed seeing Women on the Verge again. Again, that's probably the third or fourth time I've seen that. Um, and um, women talking. I did see in a theater, which was pretty full. So around here, oh, um, good. It was, okay. yeah, it was getting a, a decent audience. I don't think it's there now, but um, it was a great way to see it. Up and uh, I was up and close, but it, it did feel like I, I, I still, I want to see that on stage. I think that would be really powerful yeah. on a stage because yeah. it's yeah. funny. We were just talking about concentrating the story world in the space, and you know, the laws of, of proximity sort of just give you this inherent tension and this inherent interaction with characters. And I think. Um, even though Polly does it, she doesn't get the benefit of it. But I think on a stage, you would definitely get the benefit of it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, this needs to be – I agree. This would be an outstanding play. Outstanding play. Um, tell you what we haven't done. We haven't played uh -oh. Who Am I? <gasps> Who Am I? I think I prepared for this. So well, yeah, we haven't seen very many uh, male characters on screen. No. I mean, I'd um, – which is not odd. That's a ridiculously sexist yeah, thing yeah. to say. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to step into the, 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 the shoes of a female character. But yeah. um, watching this this week's pairing, yeah. um, I've, I've got an idea of who I, th who I would like to imagine I was. Um, I mean, I, I wish I could tell you with a straight face. Oh, yeah, Antonia Banderas. That's me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but strangely, no, I, I can't quite pull that off, I'm afraid. But I did. The, but the the only man who really appears in women talking august i i yeah, maybe i flatter myself mm. you know, I, I would like to see a bit of myself in his character insofar as i would i would hope to try to be the good man on screen maybe that's unrealistic and maybe i'm being too kind yeah. to myself but oh. did, did you see yourself on screen this week that's sweet yeah um <sighs> I think so. I'm going to cheat because I'm going to say two people again. Um, <laughs> I really did. I related to Peppa in so many ways. Mm. Yeah, I loved her. I loved her character. Um, and I think, obviously, I, it's I'm relating more to her as a character who has just all, has all these invented troubles getting in her way. And that reminds me a lot of my life where <laughs> all these things just happen. Um, and I probably make things worse than they actually are. Um, and I just sort of let myself get in the way of um, of my life, and that's I think that's just great storytelling, though, as well. That's what as a, as a writer you want to give your 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 protagonist lots of problems. So I think I related to her in that way. 
Um, I loved the cab driver too in <laughs> Women on the Verge. And I loved it because he was so pleased with himself for providing all these wonderful things in the cab. He got so – I mean his story arc is great because then, then the second time she's in the cab, he's angry with himself because he doesn't have eye drops. And then in the final scene, he's fully prepared. He's got the <laughs> eye drops. So I just like this – Pleased with myself for sort of doing great setup for other people and then angry for not getting that one detail and then finally redemption by being fully prepared on the third time. So, I mean, I, I, I knew it was going to be three times. I didn't remember how many times he appeared, but that's that classic rule of three in cinema. Yeah, rule of three. And uh, I just knew he was going to show up three times. But it, it's wonderful because he's got this clever arc that Almodovar just knows to give him and – uh, and then, he, you know, he works pretty hard in his storytelling. He's sort of going backwards to, um, okay, how's, how can I get the cab driver to his, you know, his being happy with himself again? And it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's very well acted, too, because he is so angry with himself for not having the eye drops. And then he's so pleased with himself at the end. It's just uh, – and, and Peppa is, too, and she, she acknowledges it, too. It's just a it's this wonderful little story arc for this one character who's in there. So I, I, I probably identify more with a minor character who's mostly pleased with himself. I would give you five stars on Uber. Thank Definitely. you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> oh. Right. So we just have time. We have just have time before we wrap it up to play to play uh, or to talk about also play. Oh yeah. At this theatre. I think you're up first. Uh, my daughter is doing Jane Eyre at school uh, currently, and so this weekend she'd said, oh, "Please can we watch a film version?" So we watched the 2011. Uh, Carrie Fukunaga um, oh, yeah. movie oh. uh, with uh, Michael Fassbender as Ooh. Mr. Rochester and Mia. Now it's Vasikavaska, I think, who's an Australian actor playing Jane. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed it, actually. It looks great. Won the Oscar for great costumes. Um, but it does underline that um, Mr. Mr. Rochester is frankly mad, isn't he? And no sensible woman would go anywhere near him. Oh, that's, uh, that's the main take-home message I took home from Jane Eyre. Oh, nice. It was good fun. Oh, good. Uh, have you seen anything else this week? I did. Um, yesterday I saw the live-action short film Oscar nominees. So there were five films, mm. one from Denmark, which takes place in Greenland. Uh, there was a Danish film, I think. Is that right? Two Danish films? No, that other one must have been from somewhere else. Um, there was a American Italian film, a fantastic, what do we say, Luxembourgian Luxembourg film? What do you say? Yep. Yeah. Luxemburger is it? Luxemburger. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and then finally, an Irish film. Um, hey. And I, I, I still wonder about short films. I know we've all made them. Um, but they're not very useful, honestly. And a lot of these were not that short. The shortest one was definitely the best one. I love this. So if you watch the Oscars or pay any attention, I loved a film called The Red Suitcase. That was the one from Luxembourg. Um, totally relevant. Really very visual. Um, a little bit of, um, I guess, Farsi in there and a little bit of French, a little bit of English. So it's definitely multilingual. Um, definitely the best film of the bunch. Um, and then there was a film, and this is the other thing about short films. Okay, so one of these was either it was purchased by Disney or it was um, produced by uh. Disney. Doesn't sound like a very independent thing, does it? And then uh. one of the producers was Alfonso Cuaron. <laughs> so you start to think, I mean, a lot. The, the, I think this is one of the things that I dislike about um, uh, short films, especially ones that get, get a lot of... Um, Buzz is that they always seem to be someone related to someone else or someone who has access to someone else. So it's all about connection ultimately, especially – and that was a film. That was an American-Italian production. Um, so the American films never feel like proper short films that are by up-and-coming filmmakers, which is what I think they should be. They're actually people who are entrenched or somehow incestuously involved with other established filmmakers. So that's I think that's why I'm also very dubious of them. But. Uh. What is, what's this term I learned this week, actually, for the first time ever, which I'm sure, you know, Nepo baby. Have you heard that? No. Which is, which is like... Oh, um, nepotism. Which, which is, yeah, nepotism. Uh, but so, like, all these actors are great, but they're all Nepo babies. They're uh, all kind of the sons yeah. and daughters of previously established A-listers. Yeah. I got to say, the, the film that I really loved, and there's something of a Jane Eyre connection, um, and it's not even in film, really. Um, I saw a version of Frankenstein by this group out of... Uh, 
Chicago called Manual Cinema. So they're right. technically a puppetry group. They do a lot of shallow puppetry with um, um, silhouettes and stuff. Um, they use the old-fashioned, we call them overhead projectors in this country, where they've got this sort of glass slide that they've scribbled on, and they can put it up on screen, and then they can put it, other slides in there, too, to make action happen. Um, they also use cameras a bit now, too, so... It's it's really incredible, and they use live, live actors as well. So you've got this sort of combination of art forms coming together. But at the above the stage, they've got everything projected on a screen. So it's sort of it is a cinema. You're seeing a film, but you can also watch this incredible live band performing the music while these actors are occasionally on the machines, like running slides across. But they're also sometimes putting on like a prosthetic nose or some sort of costume and acting in shadow or acting directly to a camera. There's all this crap happening at once, and it's they're they're making the film again and again um, over the course of a weekend. They did I think four or five shows, and I saw the last one, and it was fantastic. I've seen them, so I had to travel travel to Boston to do this every time, but I've seen them I think four do four shows now. Whoa, um, and it's. It's incredible. It's absolutely Sounds incredible. Sounds like a blast. Yeah, yeah. I definitely look. And I think you can see most of their stuff online. So it's worth looking up Manual Cinema, M-A-N-U-A-L. Manual Cinema. Yep. Manual Cinema. Watch some trailers or I think they have their entire films up there to view. Um, but seeing it live is incredible because the you know all the musical cues are there. The 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 All the musicians are doing everything live on stage. I, I think they have some pre-recorded gigs, but um, it's mostly live music. Um, but you're also seeing that the acting is live, the, all the transparency work is live, the camera work is live. It's just, it's incredible. So it is a cinema experience, but so much more. It's like a live cinema experience. Some. Yeah. Oh, man. Right. The other thing I've written down on my list here, the Red Suitcase. Okay, place your bets for Oscar winner then, Red Suitcase. That's the one that should win. That's it's the, the best film by a country mile of the five, yeah. Speaking of country miles, bears. Talk about bears. Bears, bears. Next next <laughs> week it's bears. We're gonna well, next week we're gonna talk about something stupid of the popcorn counter, and then the week after we're gonna talk about bears. It's cocaine bear versus grizzly man. Who will win? I can't wait to see them both. Be good. Thank you for joining us. As always, uh, we will see you uh, next time around at the Trivial Cinema Club. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.